So without an introduction, you can read his bio. Everybody knows Larry. Larry's job, really simple. I said, Larry, contacted him some months ago. No pressure. Can you define the problem for us? <laughs> and he said, damn you. <laughs> but the answer is yes. So I don't need to go into it. Larry. Thanks. That is uh, one of the most interesting introductions I've ever had. <laughs> it, it's really very zen, the introduction of no introduction. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> well, I'm here partially to pay my respects to uh, Edward Wilson, who introduced uh, this uh, term to the culture in 1998. Uh, He's a Harvard man. He is uh, one of the uh, world's leading experts in uh, myrmecology. I didn't know either. Uh, a myrmecologist is an expert in the study of ants, A-N-T-S. Uh, in addition, he's an expert in the fields of sociobiology, ecology, biodiversity, environmentalism and uh, uh, scientific human humanism. And besides that, he's won two Pulitzer Prizes. Here was a comment from uh, Professor Wilson, which gives you his measure. Look closely at nature. Each species is a masterpiece, exquisitely adapted to the particular environment in which it has survived. Who are we to destroy or even diminish biodiversity? Well, I don't know anyone who could argue with that. So I want at the outset to acknowledge that. I think that Dr. Wilson's motivations are entirely noble in spite of the criticism I shall uh, engage in. And I think that uh, his opinions ought to be respected. But this does not mean that they should not be questioned. He is not the individual who introduced this term to Western cultures. It, the term originated uh, in the mid-19th century, and it comes from uh, the Latin con, meaning together, and the Latin cilians, meaning jumping. So he defines consilience as literally a jumping together of knowledge by the linking of facts and fact-based theory across disciplines to create a common groundwork of explanation. And so consilience is therefore the principle that evidence from unrelated sources especially science and the humanities, including literature, art, philosophy, religion, music, history, and so forth, can converge and produce unified conclusions. There is a more general definition, which I like. Consilience involves the conviction that there is a deep, fundamental unity that connects the seemingly disparate things of the world. Now, when his book came out in uh, 1998, I had... Uh, an early read of it, and I thought, this is just terrific. It's about time somebody did something with this unification of apparently disparate uh, areas of knowledge. Well, the culture sort of jumped on this with open arms, and uh, everything is named consilience these days. There's a great winery in Santa, the Santa Barbara area in California where you can buy your consilience Pinot Noir. Uh, <laughs> Xerox has a company called Consilience Software. Uh, there are Consilience Technologies. There are any number of consulting groups that have, have grabbed this, this name. Uh, if you're into jazz, you can buy a new album by Vincent Vallega, a jazz uh, musician named Consilience. If you're into art, uh, check out Lisa Waller's website. She has a new painting called Consilience. Uh, you can get your frosty coffee mugs uh, off the internet, uh, got Consilience, and you can even buy Consilience coffee to go with your coffee <laughs> mug. So, you know, there's just no end to how the eight cultures embraced uh, this idea. I find it interesting to go back in history and look for cons Consilience precursors. I think they're everywhere. Uh, I think that the central message from Buddhism and Taoism 
is a form of this conciliant operation. Uh, speaking of the uh, complementarity of yin and yang, the feminine and the masculine, the active and the positive, and all of these things prefigure this idea of conciliance. Well, the Greeks were early on into this idea. This is attributed to Homer. A single era is easily broken, but not ten in a bundle. Uh, there are all sorts of aphorisms and folk sayings that point to the legitimacy of this idea in one way or another. Uh, my favorite is the Ethiopian saying on the bottom that when, when spider webs unite, they can tie up a lion. Uh, Schiller got in on the act. Uh, a synthesis which embraces such a multitude of facts does not rest solely on any one set of them and in a sense grows independent of them all. I think that uh, Niels Bohr uh, actually tapped into this general idea with this principle of complementarity. Mutually exclusive or contradictory descriptions can be necessary to give a more complete representation of a particular phenomenon. And I am sure that some of you old unreconstructed hippies will agree with me that maybe the best all-time description of consilience was the motto of the first Whole Earth Catalog, which was published in 1968, saying that you, you can't put it together, it is together. Well, I want to review some of the uh, opinions of Dr. Wilson. Uh, this is what he had to say about consilience of science and the arts. Neither science nor the arts can be complete without combining their separate strengths. Science needs the intuition and metaphorical power of the arts, and arts needs the fresh blood of science. He uh, uh, says uh, this about consilience of science and spirituality. You, you say that science cannot explain spiritual phenomena. Why not? The brain scientists are making important advances in the analysis of complex operations of the mind. There is no apparent reason why they cannot, cannot in time provide a material account of the emotions and ratiocinations that might accompany spiritual thought. This is what he says about the consilience of science and ethics. The evidence, I believe, favors a purely material origin of ethics, and it meets the criterion of consilience. Causal explanations of brain activity and evolution, while imperfect, already cover the most facts known about moral behavior with the greatest accuracy and the smallest number of freestanding assumptions. And yes, I've, lest I forget, I, I may be wrong. This is what he says about uh, science and, and ethics uh, uh, in, uh, in a further comment. I think it is an error to pivot discussion of ethics upon the freestanding assumptions of contemporary philosophers who have evidently never given thought to the evolutionary origin and material functioning of the human brain. In no other domain of the humanities is a union with the natural sciences more urgently needed. Well, I was getting a little nervous about this time, uh, but uh, I thought I just may not have understood his drift, but it became clear with further reading. And this uh, sort of cemented my suspicion that for him, the material realm is absolutely primary. The general structure of the human nerve cell has now been charted in considerable detail. Its electrical discharge and synaptic chemistry are partly understood and can be expressed in formulas obedient to the principles of physics and chemistry. And for uh, Professor Wilson, the brain makes consciousness. The stage has been set to attack the master unsolved problem of biology, how the hundred billion nerve cells of the brain work together to create consciousness. The task is made somewhat easier by the fact that disciplines within biology itself are now generally consistent and growing more so uh, with each year. 
And so I, at this time, I'm beginning to get a little nervous about this consilience idea because he asserts that the material is primary. I can't see how there is any true authentic consilience, any genuine jumping together because there are no equal status accorded to the jumpers. And so the jumping becomes essentially a cosmetic operation. Now, if there's uh, a, an excoriating opinion that has ever been rendered toward this point of view, I think it might be Sir John Eccles, who won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1963. He and uh, his uh, partner, Karl Popper, promissory materialism is a superstition without a rational foundation. It is simply a religious belief held by dogmatic materialists who confuse their religion with their science. It has all the features of a messianic prophecy. Now, if you go to the index in Wilson's book, here's what's missing. There's no mention of parapsychology or psi. There's no mention of non-locality, no mention of entanglement, and certainly no mention of healing. It is true that in the text, ESP and psychokinesis are mentioned, but they are compared to sorcery and sympathetic magic. So one wonders how Wilson can speak of a unity of separate categories of observation and thought when so much is left out. Well, he was not done. He, uh, this book, the, the next book after Consilience was his 2000 book, 2006 book, The Creation, in which he suggested that scientists ought to, quote, offer the hand of friendship to religious leaders and build an alliance with them. And he said, science and religion are two of the most potent forces on earth, and they should come together to save the creation. But before that, in the 1998 book, Consilience, he was deeply ambivalent toward religion. But religious belief has another destructive side, equaling the worst excess of materialism. An estimated 100,000 belief systems have existed in history, and many have fostered ethnic tribal wars. Each of the three great Western religions in particular expanded at one time or another in symbiosis with military aggression, so that true character arises from a deeper well than religion. And as recently as four years ago, he had begun to walk back his plea for a unification or a consilience of science and religion. He gave an interview to New Scientist a Journal which, uh, in which he said, religion is dragging us down and this is a direct quote. So I would say that for the sake of human progress, the best thing we could possibly do would be to diminish to the point of eliminating religious faith. So a central question for me in this consilience debate is who are going to be the gatekeepers? Who gets to decide what jumps together and what it is that is doing the jumping and, and what is the relative status of these jumpers? Uh, there is a huge difference of opinion on this, these questions. Uh, one person I think who was particularly wise in this discussion had a discussion here at this conference a couple of years ago, the philosopher Jeffrey Kripal who uh, is at Rice University in Houston there are those who claim that consciousness is not its own thing, that it is reducible to warm, wet tissue and brainhood. But to this day, no one has even come close to showing how this might work, probably because it doesn't. Moreover, as far as we can tell at the moment, consciousness is entirely sui generis. We know of nothing else like it in the universe, and all we know we know only in, through, and because of this same consciousness. Or as the uh, research uh, engineer, Ermes, Emerson Pugh, uh, cleverly put it, if the brain were so simple that we could understand it, we would be so simple we couldn't. <laughs> no. 
Uh, there are any number of eminent people working in es esoteric science these days who flatly disagree with the certainties of Dr. Wilson that the brain creates consciousness. One of my uh, favorite uh, such individual is Stuart Kaufman, a theoretical biologist, a complex systems theorist. Nobody has the faintest idea what consciousness is. I don't have any idea, nor does anyone else, including the philosophers of mind. Now, he wasn't just being a smart ass. Uh, he has a lot of colleagues who uh, agree with him, among whom is one of the leading physicists of our time, Freeman Dyson. The origin of life is a total mystery, and so is the existence of human consciousness. We have no clear idea how the electrical discharges occurring in nerve cells in our brains are connected with our feelings and desires and actions. Now, there has always existed alongside this line of thought an uncompromising uh, train of thought uh, represented perhaps most decisively by Daniel Dennett, who's a philosopher at Tufts, when we consider whether free will is an illusion or reality, we're looking into an abyss. What seems to confront us is a plunge into nihilism and despair. Uh, there's no stopping point uh, in this line of reasoning for Dennett and his confreres. It leads to what has been called eliminative materialism uh, in which Dennett proclaims, we're all zombies. Nobody is conscious. This is from his book, ironically entitled, Consciousness Explained. <laughs> uh, it seems to escape Dr. Dennett's uh, awareness that if in fact he is right, then he is a zombie also. We're all zombies. And if he's right and, no, and that nobody is conscious, then neither is he. So why on earth would we feel compelled to be compelled by his reasoning? He has no choice but to say otherwise. There are people who have pointed out these absurdities. Among them is Bernard R. Castro, uh, the computer scientist who is extremely prolific in writing books about consciousness these days, and I recommend all of them. Here we have consciousness trying to trick itself, having, trying to trick consciousness into believing that it doesn't exist. Uh, the motivation behind eliminative materialism is clear. Because if we deny the very existence of consciousness, presto, we no longer need to explain it. And one of the uh, strongest critics of eliminated materialism comes from my old alma mater, University of Texas at Austin. Uh, it's from Galen Strawson, the uh, philosopher. Uh, this particular denial is the strangest thing that has ever happened in the whole history of human thought. So I want just to dwell on this mysteriousness of consciousness for uh, uh, just a little bit here. I think one of the best books that ever examined these issues was written back in 1980s, the late 80s, by Nick Herbert, the uh, uh, quantum physicist and expert in non-locality. Science's biggest mystery is the nature of consciousness. It is not that we possess bad or imperfect theories of human awareness. We simply have no such theories at all. About all we know about consciousness is that it has something to do with the head rather than the foot. And I'm not so sure about the last sentence, uh, <laughs> actually. Uh, Donald Hoffman, who uh, is my favorite cognitive scientist uh, these days, he's at UC Irvine. He gave a talk here at dinner one, what was it, three or four years ago. Uh, the scientific study of consciousness is in the embarrassing position of having no scientific theory of consciousness. So the question comes up, how should those of us who are interested in these uh, concepts uh, respond to uh, people who disagree? Uh, J.B. Priestley, the uh, English playwright and philosopher, wrote a book called Man and Time several years ago, and it's one of the best looks at parapsychology I've ever, I've ever seen. He, he suggests this. Of course, if a man with his theory at stake makes up his mind not to be shown that queer things are happening, little can be done except to make a face at him and a rude noise. <laughs> I've tried that before. It, I, I hope it works better for you than, than it did for me. 
And I want to circle back on this uh, insistence by Professor Wilson that we eliminate religious faiths. Uh, one would like to know, I think, what, is there anything else that would be eliminated in the process? Uh, well, there are some people who thought that that would be disastrous. Among them was Einstein, who said that science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. Sir Arthur Eddington chimed in, dismissed the idea that natural law may swallow up religion, it cannot even tackle the multiplication table single-handed. <laughs> Niels Bohr was not far behind. The fact that religions through the ages have spoken in images, par parables, and paradoxes means simply that there are no other ways of grasping the reality which, to which they refer. But that does not mean that it is not a genuine reality. And splitting this reality into an objective and subjective side won't get us very far. In the past uh, 15 or 20 years, there have been some outstanding surveys that have wondered how scientists line up on these issues. Uh, one which was very influential was published in Nature in 97. And uh, Larson and Witham found that 39% of biologists, physicists, and mathematicians, these were people who were currently working in science in the US at the time, they believe not only in a God, but in a God who answers prayers. And the Scientific and Medical Network last year, and I regard this organization as kind of a sister organization of ours, the SSE, a 2008 survey, uh, survey of 3,000 medical, technical, and engineering professionals in the UK, Germany, and France, uh, they found that 25% described themselves as atheists and 45% as religious or spiritual. And one of our own has uh, weighed in heavily on this idea, Stephen Schwartz. As a researcher, I think enduring religion should be seen as examples of empirical science. I use the term enduring religions to distinguish from transitory cults. All of the enduring faiths over generations and millennia developed a kind of empirical neuro neurobiology involving opening to non-local consciousness. Stephen continues, there is an innate recognition of the reality of non-local consciousness in all religions. A small group of materialist scientists, another small cohort of atheists, and a few small factions may think otherwise, but for the bulk of humanity across time, geography and culture, within the religious spiritual context, the reality of non-local consciousness has been foundational across all religious rituals are designed to the same end, to train a person to attain a sustained intention focused awareness. This, is, this mechanism has to do with grounding in the rituals. So I want to make a few proposals about what might guide us in the future in responding to these contentious uh, uh, positions. I think that at the bottom, we will recognize that consciousness is simply fundamental and non-local in space and time. And as such, having no boundaries is infinite and unitary. I stand on the shoulders of uh, an oft-repeated comment by Max Planck. I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative in consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything that we talk about, everything that we regard as existing, postulates consciousness. And Jeff Kripal has chimed in, consciousness is the fundamental ground of all that we know or ever will know. It is the ground of all the sciences, all of the arts, all of the social sciences, all of the humanities, indeed, all human knowledge and experience. And I want to circle back to my own uh, profession, which I think has something important to say about this debate. I believe that in the future, consciousness will be increasingly seen as a key in healing. And I'm willing to say that based on current data, separating science from religion and faith makes absolutely no sense whatsoever in the field of clinical medicine. 
And I say that based on uh, an avalanche of data that has been accumulating for the past 40 to 50 years in my profession. We now know that those people who follow a spiritual or religious path, and I have to add that it does not seem greatly to matter which one they choose, but if they choose one and stick with it, they live on average seven to 13 years longer than people who do not. And in the process, they have a lower instance of all the major diseases you want to look at, including heart disease and cancer. We had uh, a little hint back in the 90s that this evolution thinking was in process by a cover of the journal American Medical Association, which is still one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world. And here we see a uh, gloved and gowned and scrubbed surgeon with his head bowed and his hands folded in some sort of prayer before he enters the surgery suite. My wife and I have, uh, Barbara, have, a, have opportunities to talk to groups of doctors uh, about these ideas from time to time. We were giving a talk in Tacoma, Washington a while back, and uh, after our talk, a female surgeon came forward and she said, I have to share with you, too, the prayer that I always use before I enter the surgery suite. She said, when I'm gloved and gowned and scrubbed, I hold up my hands and I pray, dear God, these are your hands. Now, don't go and embarrass yourself. <laughs> don't say surgeons don't have a sense of humor. I'm a... Uh, pretty enthusiastic about this book. It's uh, recently out. It's, uh, the title really contains uh, a powerful message, Physicians Untold Stories. And it was written by Scott Kolbaba, who is an internal medicine doc in the Wheaton, Illinois area. This, this book has got some real whoppers in it. He, he, he did something I've never seen done before. He went around to his uh, colleagues on the medical staff, and he said, I want you to write up for me the weirdest thing you have ever seen. And they did. And uh, one of these stories was uh, contributed by uh, Dr. Thomas Marshall, who is an internal medicine doctor in, in this hospital. And this had to do with uh, a young woman, uh, Barbara Comiskey. And Barbara's story is all over the internet. If you want to search it for yourself, you can. But I, I, I would recommend the book. Here, here's the story, and this is an elaborate history, so I'm going to uh, rely on uh, 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 a few slides here. Uh, she was a gymnast and a talented flute, flute player in, in high school in the Wheaton, Illinois uh, town. At age 15, she developed multiple sclerosis, and there was no doubt about the diagnosis because she was taken to the Mayo Clinic, and this was uh, certified. She graduated high school in 68, and uh, entered college, but she dropped out because she just couldn't manage it physically. Uh, things went from bad to worse quickly. She had two respiratory arrests in the early 1970s. She required hospitalizations, uh, several of them, for pneumonia. She had a collapsed lung in 1980. She wound up having a tracheostomy with uh, supplemental oxygen because she couldn't breathe well. She, lost control of her bowel and bladder and had an indwelling urinary catheter and an ex ex external ileostomy to the outside. She became legally blind. She lost her vision. She was previously religious, but she lost her faith along with the other problems. Uh, she became bed bound. She couldn't stand up. She had severe contracture. She was in a permanent physical condition in her bed, pretzeled up uh, without, without much ability to move at all. She developed her inability to swallow. She had a feeding tube inserted into her stomach from the outside so that by 1981, uh, there was not much hope that she would last very much longer. So she was entered into hospice care and was given six months at the most to live. And her internist and uh, her family got together and agreed that when she she uh, died that there would be no heroics and absolutely no cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Well, something big happened. Uh, on June 7th, 1981, uh, they aired her story on a local 
limited radio station broadcasting only in the Wheaton region, asking for prayers not only for her, but for all of the other people in the listening audience who were seriously ill. And we know that there was an overwhelming response to the prayer request because later the station received bags and bags of letters. And so this Sunday afternoon, she had two girlfriends who were visiting her and uh, all of these subsequent events were testified to and witnessed. Barbara says that uh, she heard a voice. It was a male's voice and uh, it said, my child, get up and walk. Uh, her interpretation was that God was speaking to her. Uh, so she did. She jumped out of bed, she removed her oxygen, and for the first time in several years, she stood on her own two legs. Her vision came back, and she was no longer short of breath off of oxygen, and her mother heard all this commotion in the bedroom. She came in, and apparently Barbara's body had begun to, to change. Her mother said, you, you have muscles again. Well, her father came in the room, and he gave her a big bear hug uh, and uh, waltzed her around the room. And this being a Sunday, and since all these nice things were happening, they decided they better go back to church. Uh, so they did. And uh, see, everybody in the congregation knew this woman was dying. And here she is walking from the back of the church up the central aisle to the front. And... Uh, the, the minister did not handle this well. He, uh, he, as it was described later, he fell against the pulpit for support, and he kept muttering, uh, this is nice, this is very nice. <laughs> so, uh, so everybody went home, and the next day the family took her to the uh, office of Dr. Thomas Marshall, her long-term internist who had seen her through all of this business. Here's what he said. I thought I was seeing an apparition. Here was my patient who was not expected to live another week, totally cured. I stopped all of her medication and took out her bladder catheter, but she wasn't quite ready to have the trach tube removed until another visit. No one had ever seen anything like this before. So that afternoon, he sent her for a chest x-ray. Her lungs were now perfectly normal. Uh, the collapsed lung had totally expanded with no infiltrate or other abnormality that had existed before. And he said further, I have never witnessed anything like this before or since. So she went on to marry. Uh, Marshall said, she's gone on to live a normal life. Uh, she subsequently married a minister and feels her calling in life is to serve others. Now, I want to point out to you that this case has never been written up in the medical literature. And you may say, well, these, these cases are so sensational. Where are they hiding? Uh, why, why haven't we heard about these? That would be wrong. They are hiding. And uh, we know this because, partly because of this survey by Chalice and Stem uh, that was published in uh, the 1980s. In an analysis of reports of cancer remission from 1900 to 1987, almost a century, these two researchers found that, quote, no physician was willing to risk his or her reputation by reporting a case of spontaneous regression he or she felt was due to a psychological method. So the cases don't get published because of an epidemic of what I want to call Consilience interrupt us. <laughs> There's hope. Uh, the Institute of Noetic Scientists published this go-to big volume uh, in the early 90s, describing 3,500 cases in almost any disease you want to imagine, uh, which responded to no therapy uh, or minimal therapy. So the cases are out there if you go to the trouble to find them. Uh, Candy Gunther Brown has made her task a little easier. She published this book recently, Testing Prayer, 
She's a professor of religious studies who has done healing experiments herself. And I was delighted to stumble upon this two volume set called Miracles by Craig Keener. This describes thousands of radical healings worldwide from just about every religious tradition you want to name, including non-religious sources. So if you are of the opinion that religion and healing have nothing to do with, it, with each other, I, I think you ought to check this out. If you want to go to the professional literature, here, here's one excellent uh, study. This is, uh, these are meta-analyses of non-contact healing studies that came out of the University of Northampton by Chris Rowe, who spoke at this conference, what, two or three years ago. It involves uh, 200 studies of distant healing intentionality. About half these studies concerned humans, whole human beings. About half of them concerned studies in uh, bacteria, cells, animals, plants, and so on. And the statistical power is slim, but it is statistically significant. One reason it's not more significant is that these knocker socks off cases like Barbara Comiskey never get reported in these kinds of studies. Now, I haven't said anything about uh, uh, Bill Bingston's work. Uh, I don't want to steal his thunder around. He will be talking about some of the most significant healing studies that uh, are going on currently. I want to mention, uh, I always put too much on my plate, and uh, it, it's, it's just a failing. I can't help it. Pray for me. Uh, uh, what, one of the things that uh, Wilson really criticizes in consilience is the idea that dreams and reverie and daydreaming and liminal states of awareness can tell you anything worthwhile in science. I don't know why he says this, because the history of science is chock full of exceptions. Uh, I, I had a flirtation with this uh, after Bill Bingston called me several months ago and asked me if I'd give a talk. And I was hesitant, and I didn't answer him. Uh, uh, right away, and that night I had a dream, and in the dream, Bill pops up. That's a nightmare. I don't, it's a, I don't know why I deserve this special treatment, but Bill said, you have to give this talk, and I said, oh yeah, uh, why do I have to? And he said, because SSE is in your name. He said, how can you get out of it? You, your name has SSE in it. I thought, what? <laughs> What? I said, what? No. Thanks, Bill, I, I, I guess. Uh, so you see what's, I mean, this, this is dangerous stuff. Be careful with this. Uh, I don't have time to go into some of the uh, dreams that I have, uh, uh, I wanted to share with you, uh, which led to, Nobel Prizes, great advances. Frederick Banting's uh, dream about how to, to, to how do you how do you isolate insulin? Well, he did, and he's still the no youngest Nobel laureate. He was awarded the prize at age 32. Kekulé's dream about the uh, cyclic structure of uh, the benzene molecule. Uh, Elias Howe's discovery of the sewing machine, and so. I just think there's a deeper view of consilience that, than Wilson has left us uh, to. I keep coming back to, you can't put it together, it is together. So what holds it together? And I think it's consciousness. Uh, I keep coming back to Kripal's opinion. There is a terrific book that goes into these things in case anybody happens to be uh, interested. Uh. So in summary, the, the fundamental non-local nature of consciousness constitutes what I consider deep consilience or ultimate consilience, the union of all opposites whose difference and separation are not fundamental but only apparent. And I close with quotations from uh, the recent book Transcendental, Trans Transcendental Mind by two SSEers, uh, Amance Barris and Julia Mossbridge. We are in the midst of a sea change. Receding from view is materialism, whereby physical phenomena are assumed to be primary and consciousness is regarded as secondary. Approaching our insights, 
approaching our sides is a complete reversal of perspective. According to this alternative view, consciousness is primary and the physical is secondary. In other words, materialism is receding and giving way to ideas about reality in which consciousness plays a key role. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, so y your perspective and description is beautiful. And I wonder, um, we are at a particular time in history where we're at the end of perhaps uh, materialistic reductionism and consciousness is becoming primary again. If we had been standing instead at the beginning of enlightenment, it would have been just the opposite. We would be putting this archaic consciousness away and looking at materialism as a way to understand things. And reductionism has been very successful, mm -hmm. uh, technologically at least, even though it's buried other things. Where is truth? Uh, you know, the, Truth is Simple a opening, Garrett, yes. Truth is a slippery thing. We're, we're at one point in history, we think we know the truth. A few hundred years later, won't it be different? Well, it will. I'm not sure it will because I'm not sure we're looking at 200 years in the future. I think it will be a close run thing. Uh, I, I think we may be in for some surprises that we just don't anticipate. Kingsley Dennis, who is a uh, British philosopher, has written wisely about the fact that we, in order to escape the devastations of runaway materialism, may be headed for a global planetary near-death experience. And just as many people survive a near-death experience, come out of it with a radically altered new idea about what truth is, it may be that a kind of global shock therapy might be necessary to save our, to save our, our, our species. I don't know what's uh, going uh, to happen. I would rely on a uh, comment by Edward Abbey, uh, the Monkey Wrench Gang. Many of you probably have read it, Abbey. He said, what is truth? He said, I have no idea, and I'm sorry I brought it up. <laughs> great, great talk. Uh, I just want to make a, a comment, a positive comment, about what you're saying about a reluctance about the medical journals to publish um, uh, re religiosity, spirituality, and medicine. Um, I had a, a fellow who was doing a neurology fellowship with me, and he was very interested in spirituality and religiosity. And so we did a study showing that patients with Alzheimer's disease who were higher on a rating of spirituality and private religious practices, mm -hmm. not going to structured religion, uh, churches and synagogues and that sort of thing, and mosques. Um, they, we found that they declined slower. And we submitted that to one of the best widely read journals in neurology in the world, Neurology, right. and it was accepted. So they're, they're that reluctance, right. um, it was back in 2007, uh, yeah. and we're now trying to replicate this study yeah. um, in a different population. But uh, certainly in that neurology journal, uh, that was published. Well, I really appreciate that. I uh, am an executive editor of a medical journal, and we encourage submissions like that. And uh, I think the, the tide is turning in, in medical journalism. I've had the opportunity to talk to uh, groups of uh, Harvard physicians about this weird stuff, Barbara Comiskey's healing and all that. And I recall one talk I gave uh, to them. You know, sometimes during a talk you think, this is going terribly, they're never going to invite me back and it's all going to heck. But after I made a fool of myself describing my experiences with these extraordinary healings, in the Q&A session, they begin to share their experiences with me. And so I'm convinced that you're right. Below the surface, I think there is a need and a hunger for physicians to open up and to share things that they've never told anybody before. 
almost all of these doctors would begin their revelations with the same comment. Look, I've never spoken about this to anybody, but this is what happened to me, and this is what I saw. Uh, I think we're, we're getting there, and I think uh, part of the reason is because of organizations like this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, to play the devil's advocate a, a bit, it seems like consilience is in a value competition with another value that most of us here are operating under and that the SSE has always operated under, and that is the value of the uncollapsed wave function of ambiguity and not allowing um, things to rigidify into any kind of an orthodoxy or any kind of an ideology, however inclusive and diverse and open. And so, um, you know, it's, as Jung said, ambiguity is the way of life. Um, and uh, he also said, I'm glad I'm Jung and not a Jungian. And the <laughs> idea of, skepti of, the, of the skeptics were, were Greek philosophers who believed that their powers of observation and thinking would be diminished by reaching conclusions. And so um, if we um, form a consilience, which is very unlikely, um, aren't there great dangers that, that, that the way in which the SSE and that many of us have conducted our lives um, could be diminished by, by reaching any kind of a premature consensus. Oh, I'm, I agree totally. Uh, as far as the SSE is concerned, I have no fears that we're all going to wind up thinking the same thing. <laughs> Thank you for your comment. Thank you, Larry.